Hello, I'm Eileen Roach, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery, and I'm delighted to be here today. We're going to talk about fonts, fun with fonts, right? We're going to talk about embossed fonts, applique, and puffy foam, just because they're so much fun. So let us know where you are watching from, and uh, we'll get started in a couple minutes. I see Chris Yost is here and Alicia Gentry. Thanks for watching today. Cheryl McComb, sounds like it's a lot of the OML gang. Hi, Retha up in Wyoming. Nice to have you here. And Marjorie Hirschberger in Lan Lancaster, PA. Beautiful part of our country, just gorgeous. And I'll bet in the summer right now, it is lovely. Hi, Esther. Nice to have you here. We have your town hall that we're gonna show today. So really nice to have all you folks here. Hi, Diana uh, and Isabel Rian in France. Hello, hello, hello. It's so great to have everybody here. Last week we had Sue Brown from OML and that was an awful lot of fun to have her here with us. Um, so I know that many of you probably have been watching uh, her sew alongs and I hope, I hope that you do that. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of this fun with fonts, right? Well, today's program is brought to you by our Bird's Nest tool. And I'm going to be talking about the Bird's Nest tool a little bit after we take a look at fonts because, you know, the Bird's Nest tool, it's kind of like insurance, auto insurance. You only need it when you have an accident. And boy, are you grateful you have it when you do. So uh, we're going to talk about, you know, why it's so helpful. And then I'm also going to show you... Um, well, actually, I'm not going to show you. I'm going to have Ashley Jones show you how to replace that blade, which is awesome. She made a video for us because it's something that you don't really want to do live on camera. So, okay. So with that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at some fun fonts like the puffy foam. So all these fonts that I'm going to show you today are um, in my Perfect Embroidery Pro. So if you have that software, then you know exactly um, where to find those fonts. But there are many fonts out there on the market that you can purchase that uh, are specialty fonts like Puffy Foam and Applique fonts. Now, Applique is, you know, Applique fonts are really no different than a regular Applique design. And you're going to have some fun picking fabrics and threads to make those um, Applique fonts really pop. But embossing, is something that, you know, in Perfect Embroidery Pro, you can do, you have complete creativity, you can add any kind of shape of, of a frame, and it's all about compressing that negative space to allow the words or the letters to really pop. They don't actually have stitching on them. So we'll go over in, on the overhead cam in a minute and take a look at um, those details. Here's another example of an embossed embroidery design that I created in Perfect Embroidery Pro. And this was a set of bath sheets that I did for my daughter and her husband. Uh, I probably could have been a little bit more creative with the outline, but uh, that's okay. You know, time was of the essence. But I thought you'd like to see this image. When you have a big and bulky um, fabric, such as a bath sheet, a terry cloth bath sheet, that's really it's heavy. But, you know, the weightless quilter really wasn't the the right tool to hold it in place. All I really needed to do was just keep it up off of, you know, allow, keep it on top of that table so it doesn't fall off. So I just use clamps, you know, the kind that you use in woodworking, you get them in Home Depot. And I just clamp that terry cloth towel to the table on my brother multi-needle machine. And I left enough slack in the terry cloth towel to allow the hoop to travel without strain and, um, and they stitched beautifully. It was super fun. So let's go over and, on the overhead cam and take a close look. Let's start with the puffy foam. So puffy foam, you know, you have a lot of options on fabrics, uh, not fabrics, but colors. And it's wise to choose a outline that highly contrasts with the inner satin stitches. Now, this is where the puffy is. That's, un that's the blue. That gives it that dimension. I guess you can probably see if I hold it in this fashion, all the dimension that's there. But if I had made <clears throat> this outer satin, Okay, so I understand we're getting our cameras back up to speed. So if you just kind of bear with me a minute. Um, 
and maybe we have to pull it back out and bring it back in. These cameras, they kind of auto set, you know, so maybe I'll just put it down and give it a, there we, did that help? <laughs> oh, not quite. Yeah, that's, no, not really. Yeah. Would you tell us in the comments if, if the camera is fuzzy? Because I actually have two monitors here that I'm looking at and one's fuzzy and the other one is not. So just tell me in the comments over there. I know that Isabel Brian, you say you love your bird's nest tool. And Retha, you love embossing. I know I do too. I, Cause I like, uh, it's kind of neat to add dimension to uh, fabrics without adding color. It looks really great. Okay. One of you says the video is good. The other one's fuzzy, fuzzy, couple are fuzzy. Yeah, sounds like everybody's fuzzy. And it looks fine on YouTube, but not on Facebook. Ah, focus now. Thank you so much. Okay, so as I was saying, that outer satin should be a contrasting color to the inner satin. That gives even more lift to your foam. But you know, you don't have to only use puppy foam. You can mix your fonts. Here I actually have three different fonts that I've used and I added some shaping to the word treat. Look at this puffy font up here though. Oh, is that just gorgeous with the purple outline? And of course the purple contrast with the black and also with that bright orange. That's where my puffy is, super fun. Okay, I love this one. This is one of my favorite projects that I've ever done. And this is, uh, this no saying is in a co-worker's office because she loves cats and she has them. So she has this sign says, ask me about my cats. So, you know, I've incorporated a standard puffy here and then this chaotic um, puffy where we have that really jaggedy outline, super fun. So what, what happens when you stitch a puffy um, design? Well, the first color is that outer satin. And here this time I stitched it in a variegated thread. So obviously this would still be in the hoop and then you lay your puffy over top. And what happens next is the satin stitches are all filled in over the puffy. And then this is the fun part. You know, this is a little addictive. It's kind of like popping a uh, bubble wrap, right? So you just pull that away and then you've got to work it, get that little opening out of there. Oh, but isn't that fun? And doesn't that look really good in um, the variegated thread? That's our sunset medley. I love that. So to, if you have little pokies coming out, you can use a heat gun or a hot iron, although a heat gun actually works best. And you don't touch the heat, heated tip of, of the tool to the satin. You just want to apply the heat from a distance and that foam will actually suck right back underneath those threads. That's so fun, I love that. Okay, so that's puffy. That was easy, right? Okay, now let's talk about applique. So a couple of things to think about here. So we have little openings inside some letters, right? We don't have that issue on a K or an S, but we do on Bs, Os, Ds, As. So I'm gonna show you in a moment how to um, prep for that because it could be tricky to open them up. But this time I've selected that orange microprint fabric and I have a highly contrasting thread instead of matching it. So it really pops that applique, those letters. Love that. Here's uh, Varsity. And again, I used our microprint this time because these letters have very little detail. It's just block lettering and simple outlines. So I did use the microprint Buffalo Pratt plaid, which actually has, you know, a larger scale than the mini print, because it is all about scale on fabrics when you're doing applique fonts. But you know, you most certainly can play with mixing fabrics, mixing colors of the thread to outline it. It doesn't have to be tone on tone. You most certainly can go for contrast from both the base fabric, the host fabric, and the applique fabric itself. Super fun to mix and match like that. Here's some others. Now this time we have King Star thread as the outline worked beautifully, fills in over that applique and you don't see any raw edge. It's, you know, poking out. It's, that's a beautiful thread to use for embroidery. 
Now this time, I again used that microprint fabric, but I matched my thread to the applique fabric. So, you know, kind of tone on tone, but all of it pops with my base fabric, which is pretty important, right? And same technique here, same technique here, and also on the AM. But here, I thought we'd take a little look at this A, because we have an opening here. So you could digitally cut your fabrics by, in Perfect Embroidery Pro, you know you most certainly can save as artwork or export as artwork into an SVG or a FCM for the Brothers Scan and Cut, and then cut your uh, applique fabrics out in that same fashion so that they'll fit exactly. But I wanted to show you in this image, I'm gonna bring this up and I hope it's not going to make um, the camera go fuzzy, but on this image here, so I have a straight stitch tack down, that's that inner line. So my outer line is the placement guide for the applique fabric and that's visible over here. It's the inner line that's actually going to hold that fabric down. So if, it, if you have assigned the straight running stitch, then it's probably best to cut in the hoop and not pre-cut. You'll just get a, you know, more insurance. So I take my fabric, my applique fabric that I have already applied, fuse me to the wrong side. That Remember, that's our fusible web and it's really soft and luscious, but it does have that adhesive backing on it. So then I take my applique fabric and I just gently fold it to find, to kind of expose the placement guide underneath. And then I just snip right here. So that little snip, and I can even take out a little triangle, just the tiniest little bit. And of course, that's not going to just snip out of there, right? So let's do that. I snip this out of place. And then when I open that up, I make sure that little hole is centered over that opening. So once all of this is tacked down, it's easy for me to just slip the tip of my scissors inside and snip away that opening. And of course, it's much easier to do the outer dimension of the letter A. And uh, then, you know, there you have it. So that's how you would do it in the hoop. It's that easy. So let's see uh, if you have any questions. Oh, Pat Page, she got her mini prints the other day. They are so cute, aren't they? They're just bright and colorful. They're really fun for summer. I love that. Absolutely. Um, I had a lot of fun designing them. And there'll be more of those coming soon, definitely. And CB Knit, you love that snipping tip. You know, it's a real lifesaver because, you know, text is small, right? So those little openings of the A's, B's, D's, and O's are really difficult and challenging. And you can often poke your scissors all the way through the host fabric, which you don't want to do, right? You just want to make that, you know, cut out the applique fabric in itself. So if you don't have a digital cutter and you're going to be cutting in the hoop, do that. Absolutely. It's, it's a time saver for sure. I'm glad you like that, Marilyn. Absolutely. It, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Now remember it, you know, you have to remember it next time you're doing uh, applique in the hoop like that right? Often we learn these tips and then we don't remember to use them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about if we go over and we take a look at the bird's nest tool, because that is on special this week. It's $29.99. If you don't have it, I would encourage you to order it because it is a lifesaver. And someone already said, boy, they sure were grateful they had it in, um, you know, in their sewing room when they needed it. And you never know when you're gonna need it. So I'm gonna head over to the machine and I'm just gonna show you what's in the box and really why it is so long. So what's in the box, it comes in a nice zipper case. And when you open it, you're gonna find a replacement blade and a hook and the, uh, Bird's Nest tool itself. It has a protective cover over the blade, which I'm actually not gonna remove right now, but you would just slip this right off. If I had a bird's nest problem right now, 
what I would do, you know, the problem is you can't get your scissors under these big hoops, right? The problem always occurs way, you know, in the middle of the hoop, which you cannot access with, you know, scissors, right? So what I do is I first go in with the hook and I locate that thread and holding that with one hand, I then go in with my blade and just slice between the hook and the base of the machine. So the hook is actually positioned against the bottom of the fabric, really that's where the stabilizer is. And then once that's lifted, you'll have you know tiny little bit of space to just go and snip those, those uh, threads that are you know, caught probably all around the bobbin case. You know what a hot mess that is, right? So um, we're going to let Ashley Jones show us how to replace the blade. And she's good, you know, you'll see all the parts of the uh, bird's nest tool in Ashley's video. So let's go ahead and play that. I already have my bird's nest tool out of its protective case. I have my stitch releaser, my thread hook, and one replacement blade. To use the stitch releaser, you'll need to remove the blade cover. Be very careful, there's already a blade installed. If you ever have to replace the blade, let me show you how to do it. I'm gonna use a pair of pliers for safety reasons. This will make certain that I avoid the cutting edge of the blade with my hands. To replace the blade, lift on the bottom part of the blade. It is thin and flexible and slide the blade off the end of the tool. To replace the blade, you'll line up the opening on the blade with the groove in the tool and slide it down until it clicks. Once you're done with your bird's nest tool, make sure to replace the blade cover and put your bird's nest tool back in its protective case. Isn't that great? I mean, that's how easy it is to replace the blade. Now, remember, when you purchase it, the blade is already attached to the handle. But what you have in the case is an extra blade. My hope is you never have to use that extra blade, that you don't make that many mistakes, right? They don't go dull very quickly. So let's see. Marilyn Wicko says she uh, couldn't run her sewing room without this tool. And just knowing it's there makes her life easier. Well, that's that's a good comment. I like that. But you know, please don't run with it in your sewing room. I know that's not what you meant here, but right? Don't run with scissors. That's one you definitely don't want to run with. Okay, so let's see. Beverly steams up um, steams mo. Do you have to use fuse me on the back of all applique pieces? Um, Beverly, it's kind of a personal choice, but you know, I do like to use Fuse Me on the back of all of my applique pieces. It that way, now in those applique letters, I there's no stitching on top of the applique, just at the, the, the outer edge, which is um easy, you know, which is wonderful. But sometimes you are adding stitching on top of applique in the center of the applique, and that can cause puckering or wrinkling if you haven't used a fusible web and applied the heat, you know, right in the hoop before those other stitches are uh, laid down. Yeah, definitely. And Pam, let's see, you've only had to use it once or twice, but wow, when you need it, you need it. Very true. Absolutely. And it's a lifesaver. I mean, because sometimes the only other solution, most certainly you take the foot off, right? And try to remove as, try to release it from the, the machine. And, but sometimes you can't, I have literally had to cut it out, you know, cut a hole in the fabric to get it out of the machine and you know it all gets sucked down in the opening of the machine bed so you know let's see and let's see esther you have never used fuse any kind of fusible behind your applique well good for you you know if you've had success success with it i can tell you if you 
have had a, the experience of applique that you weren't really satisfied with, that could be a good solution for you, definitely. And uh, oh, Judy Whitaker, sadly, you use your bird's nest tool all the time. That's hysterical. Yeah, and Rita, you wanted to know exactly what is that stabilizer called again? So I use Fuse Me, F U S E M E, and we sell that on our website. Yes, ma'am. And Isabel, it does take stress just to know you have the tool available. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see, Pam wants to know if I have time to talk about the magnetic hoops for the quick snap system. I'm not set up in this space to show that. And I, so, but I appreciate the question, Pam, and we most certainly will add that to our agenda in an upcoming uh, broadcast. Actually, next week, we're talking about stitching moldables. So it might be a really good time to talk about those quick snap frames. And folks, for if you aren't familiar with our quick snap frames, they are snap hoop monsters for multi-needle machines. So let's add that to next week. We most certainly can. So I, hopefully, Pam, you can join us again next week at 1 o'clock on Thursday. And if you can't make it here at 1 o'clock on Thursday, you most certainly can watch the rebroadcast at any time on YouTube or on uh, uh, YouTube. Did I say YouTube? YouTube and Facebook. You know where to find me. Okay, so now, hey, let's look at embossed, uh, embossed uh, fonts. Let's go over to the overhead, and I'll get rid of this applique. And I stitched out uh, in the word embossed. And I, for and there's a good lesson here because that's a big word, right? A big word. It's you know multiple letters. It you are seeing it pretty well over the camera, but I can tell you in person from my angle, it's not quite legible. So some choices you have are now this is just thread that is stitched down in all this negative space that is the exact same color of my terry cloth fabric. But on this one, I did everything the same, but I did a running stitch outline of each of the letters and the, the shape itself with a uh, medium gray thread. And that is what really helps, uh, kind of help that pop, pops that negative space and separates the embossed area from the puffy, well, not puffy, but the embossed area. So let's take a look at how it does really pop when you have bigger letters. So this letter M on right here in this image, there is no outline of the light gray thread as I did here. And really you don't need an outline on this large letter. You can see that no matter what angle I'm showing it to you, you really do see how that letter pops. So when you're using a lot of text, like long numerous letters in a rather small space, then I would encourage you, maybe you might find that it will help pop if you do a contrasting outline. But sometimes, you know, you just, you wanna do it in quilting. So look how it pops in quilting. So in, instead of doing a complex fill, I did a stipple stitch and we're gonna go into the software and I'm gonna show you how to do all that. So you can get a uh, really good look. But um, that's the same M and I have a four inch square stitched. That's the outline and there, you know, it really does pop. I'm hoping you can see that kind of hard to see white on white, but anyway. Okay, it looks like we have an OR nurse here. She says, when you put the cover over the blade after use, leave the cover on the table, then slide the blade in the cover then pick up the handle to continue to slide it on the upper edge of the cover. She's a nurse. Well, Judy, that's excellent advice. I love that. So hold the blade on a work table, right? On, a, on the surface, extending that open area of the cover off the edge of the work surface. And then that allows you to just slide the blade in there. Great idea. And let's see, Diana Mullins Atkinson, does embossing work well on cuddle fabric? Absolutely, it sure does. It works well on um, napped fabrics, you know, like terry cloth, like many cuddle fabrics, minky fabrics, 
You have to be careful when the fibers get really long. Like um, some of those faux furs have very long hair, so to say, very long fibers on them. It Then those fibers tend to creep over the uh, complex fill, the, the area that you have ta you know, pushed down. So you just be careful. Kind of about the weight or the height of a terry cloth towel is how it works so much. Let's see. Uh, Judy Whitaker, well, that's a wonderful endorsement. She says, trust me, once you own the bird's nest tool, you will think it is the best accessory after your magnetic coats. <laughs> Great, love that. Thank you, the very kind work, uh, very kind. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, before we get to small town charms and go into software so I can show you how to do that letter M. How about if we do that? So I'm in Perfect Embroidery Pro. And I, I will go to my shape tool and I'm just going to do a rectangle. And notice I don't have to worry about, you know, how I draw it. I can always go into the properties box and change the size and click apply. And then I'll just zoom out a little bit so you can see exactly what I'm doing. And now I'm going to uh, import my true type text and I'm going to do the letter M. And on, if I click on this ellipse, it will access all of the true type fonts that are on my computer. So everybody's window here will be a little bit different. And you wanna scroll down through your offerings, but I, it's probably best to do one that's a little chunky. So I'm gonna go with this bungee. And the default size is 300, that's fine because we're gonna resize it anyway and just click okay and okay, and it comes in super small. So we'll make that quite a bit bigger. And we're gonna select it all and center it. And select, well, it's already all selected. So I'm gonna do control C and control V for copy. And you can see here in the corner, in the color sequence, the last two are selected. So I'm going to make them red. And I will then select the first two. So you remember I have my square and then I have my letter M. So I will select both of those and go to the combine tool. And now they are one unit. And when I right click on that selected combined element, and then I do convert to complex fill. Now that was a right click to access this menu convert to complex fill, and there's my comp complex fill. It's gonna come in at normal density, which is what you you know, would expect, and it, that's too dense for what we are doing. So I literally opened this all the way to six millimeters, and it looks nasty, but it doesn't matter because all of that is gonna be stitched in the very same color as my towel or my fabric, my napped fabric. So the, these stitches actually will never be visible. So don't worry about some of that underlay, you know, and running uh, stitches, the travels, don't worry about that. So now I still, my red elements are still separate. And so I have my, my square outline and my letter M. Now I can um, convert them to a run stitch which is what I did in my sample. And I did change that stitch length to 2.4. And that's gonna stitch second. I want that to stitch after my complex fill because that's what gives it that little accent. And if you leave it as a, a separate color, you know, which of course you want to do that because you want the machine to stop after stitching the complex fill. And, um, and then you can, you can decide whether you actually want to stitch it or you will change the thread and stitch it in a contrasting color. So let's go ahead and take a look at the um, color, the simulator so you can see how it's going to stitch. And of course, that's all of that complex fill and that's what's going to hold down that terry cloth lofty fabric. And then it's, there's your, your outline of the letter and the outer square. That's how easy it is to do um, come embossing in our software. And 
it's super fun, really, really easy. So Esther Hov Hoplin, you want to know, did I use Solvi on top? Nope, I don't because, you know, these this complex fill, that's what's holding down the nap of the fabric. And that's a permanent solution, not a temporary solution like a water soluble uh, topper. So I don't bother to use anything on top. And I use a tear away, wash away on the back because I do want to tear it off and you know pull it away from the wrong side i didn't pick it out of the end but i could if this were really a towel and a gift something like that but super easy to do right and let's see where is the bird's nest tool free shipping with the code well you know um this is um there it is right below they're giving you that but you know um this is like the first peak at the week special so if it's not up on the uh, on the website that's why now minerva you want to know do you have to buy the tool shed well what i just showed you is our perfect embroidery pro and perfect embroidery pro as all of our other dime software lives inside of embroidery tool shed and Embroidery Toolshed is actually a free program that you can go and download at any time. Um, and, but if you purchase any one of our software programs, you receive Embroidery Toolshed with that purchase. And in fact, that's what it installs on your computer along with the purchase software that you uh, receive the activation code for. So um, that's, yeah. Okay, and Pam, she just alluded to all the shops are free on our website, and she's talking about the Small Town Charms. So if you don't have any questions about the software, we can move over to your Small Town Charms, because I know we have quite a, several to show. So, but you know, I hope that you're using software because it's so much fun, and that's really how you stretch your skills, right? That's why I even started the whole Small Town Charm theme. Uh, for this year and last year was our doors and it was all about getting you to take an embroidery design and make it your own either by exploring the editing features on your embroidery machine or using software to really customize the look. So let's go over to PowerPoint and take a look at the small town charms. So as you know this program goes on all year and these embroidery designs are free on our website the link is right below this was january the quilt shop february the sweet shop they come in two sizes five by seven and seven by twelve all with complete instructions on how to make each of the hoopings some have one hooping some have two some have three here is april which was the flower shop and may the outdoor cafe June was the, t the town hall, which a lot of people said that's their favorite. And I kind of think it's maybe because that clock tower and the mini roof go in together. Um, that go, you know, like a puzzle piece. Yes. And let's see, Aubrey, why am I not seeing comments using YouTube? Yes, we um, sometimes on YouTube, we don't get to see the comments. We don't really have any control over that. And I apologize. We are working on a new platform. I mean, not, not a YouTube platform, but a platform for us to push out to YouTube or, or Facebook that will allow all the comments to be shown. So I apologize if you're not seeing your comments. And let's see, oh, Seth Sweets and Stitches, you love the cafe. Yes, the, you did a great job on the cafe, if I remember correctly. Okay, and July was Scoops, home of the giant cone. So these are available the last Thursday of every month. That's when I reveal the next month's small town charm. And then if you, uh, download the design and create the design. We encourage you to post it on social media, Facebook Live, Instagram, and tag it with the hashtag Dime Sew Along. And that way we search social media looking for that hashtag and that's how we find your creations so that we can share them here every week. And you know, it is really encouraging uh, or it's inspiring for other viewers to see what you do with your small town charms because you know we kind of all learn together, right? So don't be shy about sharing your small town charm. So Seth's Sweets and Stitches, 
she kind of went crazy. She said that she didn't know where to stop when it came to adding her own embellishments. So you'll see in the sky, she's got some clouds and she has a biplane and the banner says eat at scoops, which is just adorable. Um, okay, so let, let's take a look. She's got balloons in the sky. She has uh, a sunshine with the face. She's got a bicycle on the sidewalk and some, I guess there are ice cream cones that maybe got left behind laying down there on the ground. Super cute though. Look at who's looking in the door. That's, I don't know if that's a photograph of somebody, Seth's, or is that um, fussy cut fabric that, that you had already purchased and was in your stash, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's see. And okay, so Seps, it, it, give us, make a comment because I know you're watching. Oh, Diana, you love the drop cone. Yes, thank you. That is what it's called, a dropped cone. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Pam, you're welcome. They are fun, aren't they? They are a lot of work, I can tell you. But I'm stretching my skills too because I've been digitizing each of these and every time, you know, I learn something new about digitizing. So super fun. Oh, she, Seth Fussy cut her fabric. So she has someone peeking out the door. And look at that. Take a better look at that. Isn't that adorable? She did a really nice job. Beautiful job, Seth. I love it. Just love it. Now, Chris Yost, she's got a skunk and a raccoon. In the, uh, on the right and left of the parlor, a squirrel up on top of the roof and her fabric is so well chosen. The scale of those trees and kind of, you know, a somewhat of a mountain scene in the background is just beautiful. She added her own name, Richardson Ice Cream Parlor. She did colors of her own liking. Some of those trees on that fabric are actually embroidered, like the ones that are behind, uh, you know, the ones that are to the left of the sign. And also I think in the foreground on the one on the right, just beautiful. Yeah, you're getting lots of um, kudos on your fabric selections. It's awesome, you did a really nice job. And those little critters, they are so cute, aren't they? I mean, maybe not if it's in your backyard, but embroidered, <laughs> right? On a piece of fabric, a skunk, a skunk becomes adorable. Very well done, just lovely. Oh, Mary Ann McCain Dottie, look at this. She's got a complete seafood, uh, seashore theme. She has a lighthouse up in the upper right, Ski seagulls flying everywhere, flip-flops in the foreground, and a happy sun up in the sky. Oh, you did a beautiful job on that, and your fabrics are lovely also. Love the plaid that you used for the building and the polka dot for the window boxes. And even your door is quite creative. You used, um, you know, it looks like a mad madras plaid with a little bit of a flower surrounding the window. Just lovely. Very well done. Aren't they nice? I know, and you're all saying such nice things to each other. It's great. You really do learn an awful lot from watching these. Cheryl McCombs. Here we have Tasty Freeze, established 1954. Now, if I uh, remember correctly, she said that this project brought back so many fond memories of her childhood, I guess, going to Tasty Freeze, right? And I know that my mom, you know, I'm one of six sisters, and on a warm summer night, she would pack us all up into a station wagon and take us to an ice cream parlor. And that was super fun. We all enjoyed that very much. So what do we have here? Well, that sky fabric is beautiful. And uh, maybe you pieced it so that you have uh, the green on the bottom. It could be the fabric. I'm not sure. You added some grass um, to kind of blend the two elements. That's right behind the, t the stools and, and table. Very well done, just lovely. Love the polka dot fabric that you chose for the windows and you used a variegated thread on your scallop trim on the sign. Nice, cloud, a beautiful cloud and you have a happy little bird up there. Sweet, great job. Yeah, Marjorie, I agree. Everybody has done a good job on this month's small town charm. Really, really wonderful, yeah, so nice. Everybody does such a good job and it's a lot of work, I know that. I do know that. Okay, so let's see. 
Let me see. Donna, there were six in your family and your dad never got an ice cream cone. He just filled up and cleaning up everybody else. Yeah. I know. That's what a, a mom or dad does, right? For sure. My dad had all daughters. He had no sons. So his line was always, he spent all his money on women. So we used to get a big kick out of that. And then he would say, you know, he wished he had a nickel for every bottle of shampoo that he bought. Oh, well. Okay. Look at Deborah Morgan's. So colorful. That background fabric's not something that I would have selected, but isn't that fun? It's just beach umbrellas, one after another. So colorful, every one. That's adorable. Just lovely. She used great fabrics for her building and her window box and the, um, the, the door. Really very well done, Deborah. Awesome. And Marjorie, here's yours, Marjorie Hirschberger. Also another beautiful job. Now I'm interested in knowing, um, Marjorie, what you did behind the scalloped edge at the bottom of the sign. Did you stitch it twice, like off center? Is that a piece of um, metallic thread? Uh, not thread, but ribbon, something like that. But I love the bicycle right out front, right? How many ice cream sto stores definitely have bicycles strewn on the sidewalk? As kids run in to get an ice cream cone. And Donna, you love the... Um, the fireworks, yes, me too. Very timely, just beautiful. Really a nice, nicely well done. So Marjorie, if you're watching, you used a metallic ribbon. Okay, love that. So you must have placed that first. Maybe you tacked it down during the uh, tack down segment of the sign and then added, uh, you know, that's when you added the ribbon and then you just stitched right on top of the scalp. Great, love, love that. That was, that's very well done. I'm inspired by that. I hope others are too. You might be seeing some ribbon coming up in other um, small town charms. So I think that's it. No, oh, here's Esther. Yeah, Esther Hopland. Here is your town hall from June, which you did a beautiful job on. Your fabric choices are just lovely. You did a really great job on that. And Marjorie, you did glue it down. You glued it down before stitching. That was smart for sure. Stitch it, you know, that makes it... Um, you know, easier and you don't have to worry about the foot dragging a ribbon off out of, you know, where you want it to stay. So that's a, that's a good tip to use uh, glue or tape. Definitely. And Deborah Morgan, you're using up layer cakes. So, great idea. Yeah, they are. This is a great project for layer cakes for sure. Okay. Well, folks, next week we are going to talk about stitching multiples, how to get them all matched. And we will talk about, um, you know, multi-needle hoops, um, although, you know, you can stitch multiples on any machine, most certainly. So what we'll talk about in that case will be for all machines, whether you have a flatbed single needle machine, a tubular machine with one needle or 10 needles or six needles. But uh, we'll, then we'll also touch a little bit on quick snap because we haven't getting requests for that and happy to do it. So thanks for joining me today. And we'll see you next week at one o'clock uh, right here at Central Time. Bye for now.